Hi everybody. Welcome to week five of English 3010 online. In this week's video, I want to do a couple of things to get us centered and focused on project two. And for those of you who've already started thinking through your two articles, I want to uh, give some maybe little lessons or like a mini lesson condensed in here to help you guys further your thinking on this project. So what I want to do is I want to talk about content versus conventions. Then I want to go through our weekly tasks just to have an overview of what we're focusing on this week. And then I want to talk to you guys about um, some student samples that I have posted in our resources folder. So those are the three things that I'm going to try to hit in this video. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so one of the key things that often causes students to struggle when they're working on a project where they're being asked to do genre analysis is that students get stuck between summarizing the content of the piece that they're analyzing and identifying the conventions of the piece they're analyzing. So that's the big dialectical you want to keep in your brains for this project is that there is a difference between content and conventions. In a nutshell, content is basically what the piece is saying. What's the journal article about? Is it about recombinant genes? Is it about uh, bull markets? Is it about literacy practices in Appalachia? Whatever the subject or the topic or the main argument, the content is what that is. If you were to summarize it, as you're going to do in Project Builder 5, wink, wink, you're looking at what the piece is saying. Now, contrast that with conventions. Conventions is all about how the piece is saying whatever it's saying. It's different from content. In fact, you could identify many of the conventions of a piece of writing and not get very deep into the content of the actual piece because the conventions describes how it's being conveyed. If it's in a peer-reviewed journal article, it's going to be in paragraph form. There are particular um, things to pay attention to depending on which citation style you're using, how the headers are bolded or not bolded, how the organization is set up, if it's an MRAD structure or if it's a different kind of structure. So there is a difference between content and conventions. How many times can I repeat that to you before I show you an example? Let's look at this. Okay, so here I have pulled up just a, an article, an editorial off of the online New York Times. So what's the content of this piece? Well, there are certain places we can go to look to identify content, such as the title of the piece, how to live wisely, um, sometimes if you have a genre where there's images, you can look at the images to get a sense for what this might be about. This picture might be a little vague. I'm seeing kind of a, a doubling here. Maybe it's about reflection. I don't know. Um, but this whole editorial is geared toward students on college campuses. And it's asking a student to go through some reflective questions, right? So different exercises about what your core values are, um, what really matters the most to you in life, right? So it kind of ties into this title up here, How to Live Wisely. So Richard J. Wright here is giving us several tips and tricks for how to live wisely, particularly as college students. So that's the content. Now, when it comes to the conventions, there's a lot more we can look at. We've got the header for the New York Times up here, but then we also have the section header, Education Life. We know we have the title here and the byline along with the date, which 
telegraphs really strongly that this is a piece of journalistic writing. We've got this image, there's a capture for the image, and then we have paragraph structure here, but it's quite concentrated, right? You're not going to find page-long paragraphs like you might if you were reading a highly scholarly theoretical piece. That's not a joke. It's pretty crazy how long paragraphs can get in scholarly writing. These are very short, concise paragraphs. There's lots of hyperlinks. There are recent comments over here. There's related coverage links. We have now what you find on almost every web source, web website. You can Facebook it, you can tweet this link, you can email it to someone. So there are a lot of conventions here, even this uh, advertisement, which is going to probably flash to show different things for different users. So we've got a lot of the conventions for an online piece of journalism from the New York Times. A lot of things to think about, even in terms of how the sentences are structured and what the language is like. So let's take the first couple of paragraphs. Imagine you are a dean for a day. What is one actionable change you would implement to enhance the college experience on campus? So this is a very common editorial journalistic stance where the author is speaking directly to the reader. Imagine you are dean for a day. What would you do? This is not something you find in a lot of peer-reviewed journal articles. The, the, the fourth wall, if you will, is not broken very often between the scholarly author and scholarly peers. There are some more fancy ways. So what's an actionable change? Why wouldn't you just say, what are some changes you would make? But actionable is a higher level of vocabulary that we might come to expect from a venerable institution such as the New York Times. And since it's an editorial, the author is also writing in the first person about his own experience. I have asked students this question for years. The answers can be eye-opening. So again, we have a less formal, more direct journalistic tone. And some of you are even journalism majors, so you could get into this even more than I could to show me exactly what are some of the hallmark conventions of journalistic writing. Okay, so hopefully that helps as you're going through your genre analysis, comparing and contrasting your two peer-reviewed journal articles, the one from your discourse community and the one from mine. Let's look at what we're doing this week. So under week five activities, this week we're practicing our analysis of these peer-reviewed journal articles and weekly assignments include watching the week five video, which you're already doing. Good job. Also a couple of readings. The first is a chapter from our textbook, The Wadsworth Guide. And the other reading assignment is to read the student sample text for Project 2. Now, I just recently posted three samples, and we'll take a look at the first one in a minute because I think you'll find, I think you'll find all of the samples useful, but I think you'll find the first one particularly helpful. In terms of writing this week, as I intimated earlier in this video, yes, I would like you to write a summary of both articles content. So that will be Project Builder 5. And then for Project Builder 6, I have listed several heuristic questions to take you into the beginnings of genre analysis. So that'll be Project Builder 6. Now, if you're following our schedule, you want to try to have your readings done by Wednesday so that you can be writing Friday through Sunday. Um, you might want to be writing your summaries as you're reading your student, or not your student samples. Ugh, what am I talking about? <laughs> you might want to have your articles with you and be reading them or reviewing them when you're summarizing. You'll definitely want to be looking at them as you're writing Project Builder 6. As usual, the links for both of those assignments are right here below our weekly 
schedule. Now let's take a look at the resources folder because here is where I can show you what's so cool about the first student sample. So as you know, there's helpful, useful resources here for MLA, APA citation. For this project, you may be interested in the common features of science academic articles or the common features of humanities and social science academic articles. But you'll definitely probably want to, definitely probably, what am I, some kind of English teacher? I am sure that you will want to look at these project examples, especially example number one, which is an annotated sample. So I did not do this annotation. My colleague, uh, Dr. Wallace, did this annotation. Uh, she graciously allowed me to borrow it for you guys because what she's done here is she has written response notes to the writer of this paper. So this is an actual student sample, but you'll notice here that there are little notes about what is happening in the paper, and these notes are written for an audience of other 3010 students. For example, as you read this sample introduction, you'll find comments here about what the introduction should include. The introduction should mention the discourse communities that the two articles you're looking at are addressing. And one of them is the writing studies discourse community, but the other is whichever discourse community you're investigating. So as you go through, take advantage of these comments. There are lots of really good, helpful tips, and you can kind of flash back and forth between the comments and the example here. There's even comments here about what this writer maybe didn't do so well. Um, so if there is a place where this writer wasn't as clear as we would like, that's mentioned in the comments as well. Okay, I think that about does it for our week five video. Don't hesitate to shoot me an email if you have any questions as you're going through your genre analysis this week. Um, Rayanne has posted a super helpful announcement where she talks about her experience doing this very project and some of the strategies that helped her. Um, so check that out. Also, don't forget to join the Group Me app that uh, Rayanne has set up and or shoot her an email just so she knows uh, what your situation is and how you would best like to be in touch with her. All right, hope everyone's staying warm this week. I will see you soon. Have a good week.